Baby back ribs are a wonderful match. And there are several wines that go really well with baby back ribs, in part because Zinfandel has this really pretty sweet fruit. The blend you may be talking about is Besieged, which is a traditional California field blend based on what California did pre-prohibition. Nobody was trying to make varietal wines. They were trying to make wines that tasted good and were particular for that location. They planted grapes together called Zinfandel, of course, Petit Syrah, Carignan, Alicante, Boucher, sometimes a little Grenache, sometimes a little Syrah, sometimes a little Matara or Mourvedre. But those were the blending grapes of California. And so Besieged is based on that concept. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people? hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 104. How is Zinfandel connected to old world wine royalty? When did Zin come to North America and how did it become California's signature grape? How did an opera inspire the name Ravenswood? What is Air War and how does it change the wine you drink? That's exactly what you'll discover in this episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm chatting with Joel Peterson, the founding winemaker of Ravenswood Winery in California. He's a rakish storyteller, provocateur, and sometimes a heckler of the wine industry. But he also helped make Zinfandel the runaway phenomenon that it is today. You can find links to the wines we tasted, the video version of this chat, where you can find me on Facebook Live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m., and how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 104. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show, I was watching the first episode of HBO's Industry, and it brought back memories of Western's MBA and the McKinsey interviews. Look to your right, look to your left. One of you will not be here in six months. <laughs> Culp. Thanks for the pep talk. This show is wonderfully tense and gritty. Bonus, wine is a big part of it. My pairing suggestion? Something complex and bold with a long finish. Okay, on with the show. We are joined by the godfather of Zinfandel. His name is Joel Peterson. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Natalie. I am delighted to be here. Boy, it's amazing to be in Canada, even when I'm not. (laughs) You are everywhere, Joel, and people better watch out. (laughs) No, it's great. You're actually joining us from, is it Las Vegas, where you are right now? Actually, I am in Burbank right now. I am near Universal Studios because last night we had this really wonderful charity auction and wine tasting on the back lots of Universal Studios. I was in the streets of New York City last night. Oh, my goodness. You are just, At least the yeah. fake streets. <laughs> oh, okay, great. A fundraiser. So you were leading a wine tasting, I guess, was it? Well, I was doing a wine tasting with many other people, and it's a big auction. It's been going on for about 28 years. I've been here for about 20 of them. We made some significant progress in helping to find a cure for cystic fibrosis. It's been exciting. It's been fun. The auction's great, and there are just a tremendous number of really lovely people who show up at it, as well as all my winemaking friends. It's probably some of the only time during the year I get to see people that I really like but don't get to see very often. That's a very selective comment. Now, cystic fibrosis, this is sort of off topic, but I'm still intrigued because you have just so many interesting stories. Is there a tie-in for you? Is this a cause that's close to your heart? No, it was close to my heart because Alan and Barbara Balick run it. And Alan and Barbara Balick are very good friends. 
And over the years, we've done many things together. And this is really their cause and it's close to their heart. Oh, so they're good friends. So, Joel. This is, this is such a thrill, by the way, because, is it fun? you know, I've been in this business for a very long time. And back in the old days, I mean, you had no way of doing this. It was like you didn't have a conference. There's no way to talk to all these people. And this is really exciting. I'm one of the graybeards. And to be able to be a graybeard and still be part of the uh, modern technical world is fabulous. Did you say you're one of the graveyards? One of the graybeards. Yes. Graybeards. Oh, okay. <laughs> not graybeards. No, you're not gone yet. <laughs> Sort of on trend, but not quite. Okay, so yeah, I love this too. I really do, Joel, because every week we get better at the technology. You and I were working out the sound and the visuals and everything else, and you just have to have patience with it. But the power of connection is pretty amazing. When, you know, I'm talking to you, you're in California, I'm here in Ottawa, Paul's in Virginia, Anne's in Halifax, Liz is in Sudbury, yep. and there's many, many more people. It's bringing us all together. I love this too, that the technology can bring such an old world fascination and beauty as such a non-intimidating way, like we are all sitting at the table. Okay, Joel, back to you. You have such an interesting story. I thought, well, I'm not going to have to work hard tonight. This man is just a roll of stories. So let's start at the beginning. 1976, I think, is when you started your winery, but you are the child of two chemists. Your mom yes. was a nuclear chemist who worked on the Manhattan Project, and your dad was another kind of chemist who was working on something else. So major brainiacs. And did you go into chemistry at first? I did. You know, I grew up in this crazy household with two really superstar people who made it, by the way, at a chemical honor society meeting. And I guess the chemistry was good. And that was the result. But, Words in love. I love it. <laughs> <Ta -da. laughs> so, yes, I ended up studying biochemistry and microbiology when I went to college. And I really didn't expect to be in the wine business, even though my father had taught me to taste wine when I was quite young. We used to get together on Friday evenings before his tasting and go through 10 or 12 wines because he thought a kid would have better words for wine than an adult. So if I said a Chardonnay tasted like apples, for instance, he would go out and collect different kinds of apples until we could actually sit down and smell these cut up apples and determine which was the Northern Spy and which was the you know, Golden Delicious all blind. You know? So next time we had a Chardonnay, I could say, oh yeah, this one smells like Golden Delicious apples and so forth. So, And this was uh, just was, his own informal wine club? He was just doing this as a passion, not his... He actually started one of the first wine clubs in San Francisco. You know, when my mother went out and found that bottle of, you know, 1945 Chateauneuf de Pop that rocked their world, and then they got this case of wine that was a survey of France that included a bottle of 45 Ogre and a bottle of 29 Chateau Ikem for $15.40, they began to get really serious about wine. My father started a wine club called the San Francisco Wine Sampling Society, later changed society to club because I guess it sounded more intense. Equally um, catchy. And uh, he was writing a newsletter that he put out every month and it was complex. I mean, he would write up uh, wines and he'd describe them. And I remember he described the 1949 Chateau Rouget as smelling like the spars of the USS Constitution. The what? Now, the spars? The USS Constitution. It was an old sailing vessel. Old Ironsides in American parlance. It probably meant piney and tarry and briny because I went and smelled the spars of the USS Constitution. It still exists in Boston. So what are spars? Uh, I'm not a sailing spar vessel girl. Spars are the things that go across the oh. mast in a sailing ship. Spar so and boom. They're the things that hold the sails. Okay, basically. gotcha. You um, were sniffing at spars at an early age. Yeah, yeah, sniffing at okay. spars, yeah. But nobody understood that. So he thought a kid would have easier terms for wine. I was 10. Yeah, so I came in as the kind of the simpleton, you know, to simplify language and make it basically more basic. So he was starting to do this. He wrote these newsletters on a monthly basis. He covered all the great regions of the world. There wasn't much happening in California at the time. So I really got to taste a lot of Bordeaux and Burgundies and German wines were really the core of it, some Italian. But it was a learning experience. I ended up not doing wine. Uh, I ended up in medical research. I uh, was doing uh, immunology research, stimulating lymphocytes, growing tumor cells and doing things like that. 
And then I ran into <laughs> a guy things named... like that. You mean, no, you dismiss. <laughs> well, you know, this is, you know, I could talk, I could talk about that, but you know, and the beauty is that a lot of the stuff that I was working on was really before its time in terms of the technological feasibility of it. And <laughs> we have really moved forward with DNA research and understanding how these things work in ways that we didn't before. So I'm now beginning to see some of the things that I was working on coming to fruition in terms of the kinds of therapies, the gene therapies and other things that are being looked at. So that's very exciting. But you know what? I'm really happy being a winemaker. I, you know, I think I got very lucky in that way. And interestingly enough, I'm going to take this on a little sidetrack because interestingly enough, I just got back from Croatia. And I got back from Croatia because I was part of a conference that was put on by the Croatians called I Am Tributrog. How does that translate? I Am Tributrog? I Am like Tributrog because like... <laughs> the name of the grape Zinfandel in Croatia, the home of Zinfandel, is Tributrog. That's not uh, catchy. Yeah, that's not catchy. Tributrog, it sounds like a bad player in a Star Wars movie, actually. It does. It uh, sounds like... The Borg or something that will... Anyway. And if you read Jancis Robinson in her book on amphilography, where she lists all the grapes in the world, she doesn't list Zinfandel as Zinfandel. She lists it now as Tributrog. Really? And, and that was because a university professor here, Carol Meredith, used DNA to identify Zinfandel and then Tributrog and, of course, Primitivo. They're all in the same family. And at this conference, we had people from Croatia, we had people from Italy, and we had people from obviously the United States, myself, David Gates, Carol Meredith, were all there to talk about this grape. And I learned some stuff that was fascinating. It turns out for a long time, we didn't know the history of Zinfandel. We didn't know where it came from. We knew it came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Queen's Long Island, but it didn't seem right that it was from Austria. And obviously it was from the Austro-Hungarian Empire because in 1820, when it got to the United States, Croatia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But it turns out that this grape is much older. The first historical reference to this grape is in 1488. That's wow. several years before Columbus sailed the blue to find the new world. It's a sale of a barrel of wine from Croatia to the Italians in Apulia, interestingly enough, because apparently there were some Croatian monks over there buying wine. So it's a very ancient grape. We also know even more about it now. It turns out that it was the grape of Venetian royalty, the princes and the dukes that lived on the Dalmatian coast. It turned out that the Dalmatian coast was controlled by the Venetians from 1400 until about 1800 when Napoleon kind of dislodged them, but they grew this grape. So if you went to a Venetian mass ball, one of those nice festive things, the wine you were likely to be drinking was Infidel. Wow. You know. So clarify there, Joel, Dalmatian coast, that's, is their historical roots there for Zinfandel with... Yes. The Dalmatian coast is okay. right along the Adriatic. Okay. It's part of what is now Croatia. It's part of what used to be Yugoslavia. And... It is a very interesting grape growing region. It turns out that there are 280 some odd different grape varieties in Croatia that are unique to Croatia. And that is not as many as Italy, which is 530, but it's nearly as much as, well, it's more than any place else for sure. The other part that's really interesting about this is that through the use of DNA and the work that they're doing with that, they have decided that there are these founder varieties in Europe, and there are like 12 of them that are related to all the other grapes that came out of Europe. And Zinfandel is one of the founder varieties. So it's really ancient. It's, there's about 24 varieties related to it in the Adriatic area. And in fact, one of those varieties is a grape that I ran into over there called Gurk, G-R-K, uh, which Honestly, it's delicious, but it's white. It tastes like Greco de Tufo. It's fabulous. It's got great body. It's got these really pretty aromatics. It's very, very nice. So the Zinfandel is one of them. Cabernet Franc, for instance, is another. Pinot is another. So there are these 12 grape varieties that are sort of the fathers, if you will, or the mothers of all the other grapes in Europe. 
it was one of these kind of places where you just got all this information. It was so much fun. It was like, you know, recharging my sort of information banks. As you know, Zinfandel came to the United States in 1822. It was yes. brought in by a guy named George Gibbs. Okay. He was an amateur yes. geologist. We have to do a tasting rocks. at the same time. Like, so history, yes, but also we want to get uh, your comments. Do you want to drink wine? Oh. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. There will be wine, not just theory and academia. So I want you to continue with your story, but also sort of segue into what's this one? That is Vintner's Blends Infidel, I believe. Uh, yes, I, it is. Vintner's Blends Infidel was the wine that I started making in 1983. Okay. I had uh, started the small winery and was only going to make single vineyard designated wines. And I found out that I was quickly going broke doing that. Oh. So I needed a wine that I could get out of the winery more rapidly, but a wine that didn't cheat. Mm -hmm. I wasn't out to make a wine that was anything but delicious. Yeah. And so I had to go to areas that I hadn't formerly worked very much in, Lodi and Amador and Mendocino, because the grapes were inexpensive. And I had to use a little less oak in it, and I had to move it through the process a bit faster. But it's still made with native yeast. It still you know, has French oak associated with it. So the wine is made precisely, but I could charge less for it. Yeah. And in charging less for it, I could sell more of it, obviously, and it would sell more rapidly. So, uh, so in 1983, I started a small amount. I think I made 1,000 cases in 1983. I think that wine ultimately became one of the most consumed infidels in the entire world. And Carrie is saying, again, she's a product consultant. It's a staple in her store. Excellent seller. You know what? I, I smell this and I want to tell a campfire story. I want to be camping. I, I don't like camping, but I imagine myself <laughs> to be camping under a starry vault of the night. And I just love this. It's evocative. So I want to tell a story and I want to have maybe some barbecued meats and bring a blanket. And uh, it's just, it's lovely, delicious wine. When I'm grilling burgers for friends, just throwing like those big, juicy, meaty burgers. I do a lot of buffalo burgers these days. Real buffalo? Uh, yeah, you know, bison, you know, American bison. And this wine is delicious with them. Mm. It's got enough brightness and enough acidity so that it makes the burger taste fresh every time you bite it. That's nice. Wow. Okay. So is this the entry level? That is the entry level. Because yeah. I have one other that is not Zinfandel, but Petite Sarah. So this would Petite be a sort Sarah. of a sister or something like that, right? They're similar because they're made in, that, in a similar style from grapes that cost me a little less. So most of that Petite Sarah is from Lodi, although some of it is from Mendocino. And Petite Sarah is a really interesting grape. For a long time, it was thought of as a blending grape for Zinfandel, and you right. see it in the old Zinfandel vineyards a lot, but it's got this spice, and it's got this pepper, and it's got this round, kind of juicy character to it. Um, it can be a mouth-wrenchingly tannic if you're not careful, uh, but this one is not. This one is, you know, sort of a little softer because a lot of it comes from the Lodi area. Very uh, flush. And, and what's about Lodi? I know that area. I mean, I've heard lots about it. But what is it? It's warm, it's dry, it's arid. It's less costly than, say, Napa? It's the bottom of an old lake bottom. You know, if you look at California from a distance, you can see that it's uh, got this giant depression in the middle of it, which was a giant lake. Okay. So really, you're looking, you're growing grapes in very sandy, sedimentary soils that are quite deep. Okay. And the grapevines get really big out in Lodi. Okay. And they have fairly large clusters which means that the skin to juice ratio is not quite what it is in Napa or Sonoma. Okay. You do get cool evenings. Because of that, you get this less concentrated tannin feel. And so yeah. the grapes give you a softer affect, which yeah. is very nice in this particular case. They're not frequently what you would call profound like Barolo, but they're our, they make a really nice beverage. Absolutely. Like this plush, voluptuous satin cushions falling back on satin cushions <laughs> something like that oh so good okay so we've done these two why don't we just have an intermezzo here i want to know the story again how ravenswood 
got named because, uh, you know, ravens, and I made the mistake when we were test calling of saying the word crows. They are uh, not crows. I know, and you had that gut reaction. <laughs> so let's just take it back. Ravens, woods are, ravens are smart. But what's the backstory on the name of this winery, please? You'll have to take yourself way back, way back to 1976. Whoop. When I am determined through some strange quirk of hubris that I want to make wine. And I have been working with Joseph Swan from 1972 until 1976. And so I figure I've learned the nuts and bolts and I can do this. My hair is longer than yours is now at the time. And my beard was a bit longer. And I was living in Berkeley and doing lots of Berkeley things you know, spending all my spare time with Joe Swan. So I had to find grapes and I went out and found grapes. Growers were very suspicious of me. So <laughs> they didn't think I was going to pay the bills. So I had to pay for these grapes in advance. So they were my grapes. I found these wonderful grapes on Dry Creek, uh, sort of the east side of Dry Creek, the west side of Dry Creek. They were very old. They were exactly what I was looking for. They were Zinfandel. I wanted to make Zinfandel. I knew that it could make great wine if somebody paid attention to it. So I contracted for the grapes, paid for the grapes. Uh, the deal was the guy was supposed to put them in my 50 pound lug boxes. He was supposed to load them on the truck for me. I was helping Joe Swan that day. So I was going to come up in the evening and pick them up. And I was, I waited until the last minute, honestly, to pick these grapes. And there was a rainstorm coming in and I knew I had to pick them. So I picked them or had Joe pick them and um, got up there at six o'clock in the evening to pick them up. And sure enough, they were picked, but they were spread over four acres of vineyards in 50 pound wooden fruit boxes because of the rainbows, because there were like three rainbows. It was like pretty spectacular. <laughs> and the sun was going down and uh, you know, the clouds were kind of opalescent, pink and orange. It was, it was really beautiful. But I'm in a state of panic because I've got to pick these grapes up. It's in the days before cell phones. Remember those days? And uh, I had to pick up those boxes and I started running them down to the end of the rows and you know, setting them down. Turns out you're picking up not four tons of grapes, you're picking up 16 tons of grapes because you have to pick up each box four times. So you pick it up once, you put it at the end of the row, pick it up again, put it on the back of the truck, pick, get up on the truck, pick it up again, and put it in place. It takes a long time. And the clouds are moving in and it's beginning to rain. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be really messy. I just couldn't leave the grapes in the field. So while I'm doing this, these two huge ravens float into the tree next to the vineyard, and they begin doing this kind of strange chant. It's like this rolling, throaty thing that ravens do. It's not like the caw. It's another voice that they have. And I'm thinking, this is really weird. But I continue to work into the night and loading this truck, and the ravens stick with me. Usually ravens come and go, but this pair hung out. And I got the truck loaded and it was raining around me. It didn't rain on me. And I'm thinking, this is pretty strange. And you know, I got the truck tied up, went down to Joe Swan's winery. The streets were wet, but I didn't get rained on. Joe was waiting for me at the winery to help me offload the grapes. And so we dumped them in the crusher as we took them off the truck. And about one o'clock in the morning, we finished up and the skies just opened up. And it, I mean, just it was crazy. So I'm lying in bed that night, you know, because you can't sleep after something like that. You're exhausted, but you're just, your mind is going too fast. And I'm thinking there, what is this about? Rainbows, ravens. I'm thinking this is pretty amazing. And then I remembered, because I'd gone to school in the Northwest, that Raven was the, one of the trickster gods of the Northwest Indians. And I thought, wow, I just run into my first trickster god. Amazing. And I had been reading Carlos Castaneda at the time. You know, it's a story about a guy who takes peyote with a witch doctor so he could find his internal animal spirit. And so I'm thinking, I'm primed for totem. So Raven became my totem. You are so talking I, you know, fast right now. So you got the totem. <laughs> wow. I got the totem. By 1979, I had made several vintages, but I hadn't bottled anything. And I was going broke, and I couldn't afford to bottle what I had already made. And I thought it was like the end. I mean, just like it wasn't going to work out. So a friend comes by because he can tell I'm depressed. And he says, I'm going to take you to an opera. How would you like to go to an opera? I said, yeah, that's great. Let's go to the Barber's Seville or something like that. He said, no, I'm taking you to Lucia de Lalamor. I said, oh, great. Everybody dies. And he says, yeah. He says, I want you to see how bad it can be. Maybe it'll cheer you up. Italians uh, have a knack for cheering you up because life's always worse with them. Yeah. Romeo and Juliet, everybody dies. Yeah. Yeah. So well, this is like Romeo and Juliet gone worse. <laughs> and... 
the Romeo character is a guy named Eduardo Ravenswood. In the opera, he falls on his sword, but it's based on a novel by Scott called The Bride of Larmore. Scott was a guy who wrote Ivanhoe. And it's foretold that Eduardo Ravenswood will ride into the moor and drown in the quicksand. And I thought, wow, I get ravens. I get angst with this name. I think this is the name for Ravenswood. Obviously, I didn't drown in the quicksand. And just shortly after that, I found 15 guys who were willing to sort of gather together with me and create this wonderful vision of Ravenswood. Edgar Allan Poe. Quoth the yes. raven, nevermore, nevermore. Do you tie into that as well? You didn't tie into that at all. I mean, but there are so many wonderful raven images. There is Edgar Allan Poe, but there's also the two ravens that sat on Odin's shoulder. And since I'm of Nordic extraction, you know, he had two ravens. He sent out over the world, Ugin and Mugen, thought and memory. And they brought him information and told him what was going on. So it's a, it's a great image, actually. I love all the mythology. I love that. If yeah. there's a backstory, oh my gosh, I'm there. Oh, Carrie says, ravens remember faces. True story. Ravens are true. smart, right? True true story. Ravens remembers faces. Okay, I know crows are smart too, and they have a thing for shiny objects, but what's the difference between crows and ravens? Ravens tend to be bigger. Okay. Ravens tend to be smarter than crows. Okay. Crows fly in flocks. Ravens mate for life. Ravens have territories. Uh, however, they are sociable and if they have a meal, like a piece of carrion that's down there that's bigger than they can eat themselves, they will call in their neighboring crows for a feast. One presumes they have Zinfandel, too, of course. Of course. A pairing <laughs> is always important. Because I've learned about hawks, how they mantle their food. Like, they just sort of put their wings around. It's like, back off. Yeah. <laughs> so, so ravens uh, are also figure heavily in legend because yes. of their unique personalities. In Indian legend, they found man in a pot on a beach and taught him how to uh, survive under the worst possible circumstances, brought fire and light and stole the star, moon, and suns from the other gods so that man would have his entertainment. Good Lord. Uh, that's great. Oh my gosh, I love that, that you've dug deep here. Oh, Paul, he's enjoying baby back ribs with a blend of Ravenswood. Great match. Yes, baby back ribs would be a great match, would it not? For Baby back ribs are a wonderful match. And, you know, there are several wines that go really well with baby back ribs, in part because Zinfandel has this really pretty sweet fruit. The blend he may be talking about is Besieged, which is it's a traditional California field blend based on what California did pre-prohibition. Nobody was trying to make varietal wines. They were trying to make wines that tasted good right. and were particular for that location. And they planted grapes together called Zinfandel, of course, Petit Syrah, Carignan, Alicante, Boucher, sometimes a little Grenache, sometimes a little Syrah, sometimes a little Matara or Morbet. But those were the blending grapes of California. And so Besieged is based on that concept. Okay, interesting. So I don't know if I've gone in sequence here, but would this one perhaps be next up? The That's the Old Vine Lodi. Okay, so Lodi, that would be a perfect next step. Okay, good. Tell us about this one and how it differs from the last ones we were looking at. Okay, the last one, the Vintners blend, is a California blend, and okay. that has old vines in it from Lodi and Mendocino and Amador and a little bit from Sonoma County as well. So it's a composite blend I put together to taste good, to not be kind of over the top and not necessarily represent anything except Zinfandel in California. So this is Lodi, so we've narrowed the range in which I can play. So the average age of the vines in this bottle is about 85 years old. It is all from Lodi. Lodi is this growing region which is due east of San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge forms a gap in the mountains or the hills and the air flows in through and across the bay and actually up into an about an 11 mile stretch of Lodi, which would be sort of the north-south diameter of it, in which you can grow good grapes. If you go too far to the south or too far to the north, the grapes begin tasting like brown sugar candy because it gets too hot. 
So this is an area where it gets warm days, cool nights, good diurnal variation. It's been growing grapes for a long, long time. Many old vines there. Much of this fruit during Prohibition, the reason they had so many old vines, is because much of this fruit got shipped to home winemakers in places like Canada and places like the eastern United States and Chicago and places like that. So these vines stayed in up until fairly recently, maybe 20 years ago, most of this fruit was still shipped out. But it was kind of the playground of Gallo. If you drank Gallo Hardy Burgundy, a lot of the Lodi was in it. But people like Ridge and myself began to make wines from this area. And they turn out to be really pretty. They're soft. They tend to be round. They tend to have a lot of blueberry tones to them. They tend to be spicy. And the winemaking in this is a little bit more upscale than the winemaking in the Vinner's Blend. Hmm. Vinner's Blend tends to be larger volumes, not massive volumes, but larger volumes. Mm -hmm. The Lodi tends to be smaller. Some of the tanks are punch down tanks. Some of the tanks are pump over tanks. Uh, we're using a bit more French oak in this. This gets about 20% new French oak. And it stays in barrel, you know, not 10 months, but it stays in barrel for 14 months. So it gets a little bit more time to evolve and change. So we make it a little bit bigger than the Vintner's Blend, if you will. Mm -hmm. But it also has got the character of Lodi. Hmm. So can we talk alcohol, please? So this is 14.5. So as I'm tasting these, to me, they don't taste hot. But 14.5, and I've got some others here, 14.9. Holy smokes. So what makes a balanced wine, even if you're at high alcohol? And why do these wines have high alcohol and can still not taste hot? Okay, so let's talk about why they have high alcohol to start with, and then I will give you a whole dissertation on alcohol, which is great. I'm glad you asked that question. So Zinfandel is an uneven ripening grape. A cluster of Zinfandel has berries that are perfectly ripe, berries that are slightly underripe, and berries that are slightly overripe or slightly withered on the same cluster. If you pick Zinfandel too early, and it doesn't have a few of these slightly overripe berries on it. The ones have lower alcohols, but they don't have any kind of internal substance. They don't have any character or weight or any of the things that make them into really good table wines, that make them competitive with wines that are from the Rhone or other good European wines, if you will. So you have to get some of that. The trouble with getting some of that is that these slightly withered berries have extra sugar in them. So you can pick the grapes at what you think is 23 bricks, which is, might be where you would pick Cabernet. But actually, in the fermenter, it ends up at 25 bricks. So there are two ways of dealing with that. Either you can pick earlier and get lighter wine, or you can try to find exactly the right spot. So you end up with alcohols around 14 or 14.5. Mm -hmm. Or you can do what some people are doing. You can let them get really ripe because they're trying to make these big, dense, slightly sweet wines and dilute them back, you know, hopefully, so you get to like 15 or something like that, but frequently they ended up at 16 with some residual sugar associated with them. So alcohol is like one of these funny things. I try to pick at that precise point where the wines come in between 14 and 15% alcohol, and the wines are fresher that way than they are if you let them get riper and then water them back, and they have more staying power they're just better brightness. Mm -hmm. Now, on to balance. This is a more complicated picture than anybody ever thought it was. It turns out that because of a thing called reverse osmosis, we've been able to play with alcohol. There have been several people who specialize in this. So it turns out that if you take a wine that is 16% alcohol and you reduce the alcohol level to 13.5, it actually may taste more alcoholic in terms of the way you feel it than it does at 16. It also turns out that alcohol is not linear. So if you take and you take this wine that you've reduced to 13.5 and you add back alcohol in one tenth point increments, so 13.6, 13.7, 13.8, 13.9, you know, 14, you'll find that there are what they call in the biz sweet spots. 
13.5 may taste alcoholic and 13.6 and 13.7 may taste alcoholic, but you hit 13.8 and you suddenly reach this point of harmony where you can't really taste the alcohol. The wine seems to have good character. It seems more balanced. And then you hit 13.9 and it goes out of whack again. Huh. And it goes out of whack, you know, maybe 13. I mean, and every wine is different, but maybe it'll go up to 14.2 and you'll say, wow, it's another point of harmony at 14.2. It really tastes good again doesn't taste out of balance. So things are and coming you can together. do this all the way up to scale. Mm -hmm. The effect of the alcohol is present because alcohol makes the wine taste sweet as well as everything else. So the wine will see, seem bigger and rounder at these sweet spots along the way. You know, the way I make wine and the way most people make wines, we're not using reverse osmosis. So it's a bit of a crapshoot, you know, whether you end up at one of these sweet points or not. And this is why we blend, this is why I keep all my Lodi vineyards separate from one another. And then I begin to sort of create a blend. And part of creating a blend is creating the harmony. And really part of what we're doing is finding the sweet spot for alcohol by blending. The sweet spot for alcohol, where it comes together with the flavor and it's not distinguishable as that's alcohol, that's heat, that's warmth. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Carrie is saying, hmm, punch down, is it two processes? I'm not sure what that means. Do you know? I'm not sure what she means, but we can describe punch down. You know, okay. when I was first making wine, punch down is where the winemaker literally stands on a board above the vat mm -hmm. and has a punch, which is a disc on the end of the board and pushes the must or the grape skins back into the juice so you get more of the homogenization of the juice and uh, the mixing so that you get more flavor out of the skins. Yeah. The other technique that is used, there are lots of techniques that are used, but one of the other techniques is called pump over, where you take the juice off the bottom of the fermenter and you pump it over the top of the fermenter. So you're creating this blanket of juice that then goes down through the skins and breaks them all up. They give you different things. I mean, because you're actually physically moving the skins around when you're punching down, you tend to get more structure out of a wine like that. When you pump over, it tends to be more gentle. It's a way of maintaining more of the fruit in the wine. So winemaking techniques tend to be customized to grapes. So for instance, in Burgundy, they use a lot of hand punch down uh, and they actually walk around in the musk in some places there just to get it broken up because Pinot Noir has got thinner skins and it's not quite as tannic and you're really trying to get as much you can out of it. So lighter colored grape, but in Bordeaux where they have this big, massive tannic grape, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, they tend to pump over because it gets less extractive and you don't get any of the bitterness associated with it. Wow. I need a part two here because I need to show the other wines and have another conversation with you. Okay, so I'm going to show you two wines here, Joel, from the Dickerson Vineyard, because I have them here. 2013, 2014 from the Dickerson. If you want to tell us a little bit about these, because um, I these would are amazing. be happy. Okay. <laughs> those, are, those are my single vineyard designated wines. Okay. And so we've just kind of moved down an echelon or up an echelon in the sense that yep. the vineyards I make just in single vineyard wines are really unique, very special vineyards that stand alone. They just make mm. terrific wine. So Dickerson Vineyard is a vineyard that was planted in 1920. 1920? Uh, it's on, on Zinfandel Lane in Napa Valley. It was one of the first vineyards planted on leaf roll infected rootstock. So this changes the way the vineyard metabolizes. So instead of being big and round and plummy, like you might expect a Napa Valley Zinfandel to be, it tends to be have more red fruit, lots of raspberry tones, lots of spicy tones, some cedar aromatics. And there's a little bit of a mintiness to it as well, because there's a hint of the koala. There's a eucalyptus tree not so far away from it. So it has what I call terroir. Terroir. Uh, I wanted to get to that. Now, okay, that's pretty cool. Terroir we know, or geeks know. Terroir, climate, soil, etc. Yeah. But um, what is terroir? Terroir is what you get from the environment around you. So the French like to talk about garrigue. 
in southern France. They like to say that the odors of the lavender and the wild thyme and things, the oils blow off across the grapes, they land on the grapes, and they flavor the wines. We certainly know that that's true with eucalyptus. I have seen it also with things like bay trees. I have a friend who uh, does wine analysis, and he takes things apart with this gas chromatograph. And he once gave me an extract, and he said, hey, what's this? One of the wines. And I said, geez, it smells like a, uh, a fry restaurant. It smells <laughs> like greasy. And he said, yeah. He says, this vineyard is right behind a fast food restaurant that vents out over it. He says, the character that you're getting is, in fact, you know, fry grease. We tasted the wine, too. You couldn't actually taste it in the wine. It comes out as a slightly interesting character. You wouldn't say, oh, my God, that smells like a greasy spoon. But it's there. And the same, if you showed me another one that was next to a diesel truck stop. In his fraction, you could actually smell the diesel fuel. But in the uh, wine, it was there. But it was like, you know, only if you knew it was there. What's happening? Is it the molecules, airborne molecules settling on the leaves or the grapes? Uh it's actually the airborne molecules settling on the clusters. Uh, you okay. see it most radically with, say, eucalyptus trees, which produce oil. Yeah. And in windy years that are quite hot, uh, the wines tend to have, they're near eucalyptus, tend to have a more eucalyptus flavor associated with them because there are these little drops of oil that blow out across the vineyard and ultimately are highly flavored. If you've ever been in a sauna with eucalyptus, you know how distinct it is. So those, when those get on the grapes, they're there you know, to stay. They go through the whole winemaking process with you. Huh. So they actually impact the flavor of the final wine? They do. Absolutely. Heinz Martha's Vineyard is a perfect example of, the Heinz. you know, how every, everybody talks about how minty it is and how yeah. eucalyptus it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that's that. And taste almost any Australian Shiraz. Always has that kind of minty eucalyptus, you know. That's because it's got eucalyptus around it. Interesting. Okay. Well, we will take your word for it. But I, I've sensed it too as well. So we've got the Dickerson. Is there much difference in your opinion between the 2014 and the 2013? Not really. They're both from the same vineyard. 2013 was a bit of a smaller vintage, so it tends to be a little bit more concentrated and there tends to be a little bit more roundness to the fruit, but they're mm -hmm. both very pretty. Uh, Bill Dickerson was a very good friend of mine. He and I were running at a Domaine Chandon race before I knew him, actually. He was in my father's group when I was a kid, so I'd run into him before. And we were running along and I looked over at this guy and I said, I know this guy. And I said, don't I know you from somewhere? And he looked over at me and he said, I'm sure I don't know you. I was in my long hair days. And I said, yeah, that's a North Carolina accent. I know you. You're Bill Dickerson, aren't you? And he looked at me in a slightly horrified way, thinking I was probably one of his patients. Uh, he was a psychiatrist. So he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I got a little winery. I said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I got a little dinner. You know, and I found it to grew Zinfandel. So I'm, we're running along. I'm trying to negotiate Zinfandel from it. And uh, he says, you know, maybe you'd like to start running now. He said, we're getting near the end of the race. We can talk about this afterwards. Now, he's old enough to be my father. So he's like 20 years older than I am at least. And um, I'm thinking, okay, old man, let's run. And he beats me by a full minute. It was pretty embarrassing. Wow. Um, so we ended up doing this vineyard together. And uh, he insisted that I make wine for him as well. So he had something called Dickerson Presso yeah, Vineyards. And it was the same wine, basically. I would start the bottling line. I'd bottle myself a thousand or eight hundred cases. I'd bottle two hundred cases for him and then I'd finish up with the bottling line. But you know those wines never got the same score from the wine writer? Yeah. Really? And sometimes even in the same periodical. Those, even though they were identical wines. Yeah. Those so, wine writers, they're so unreal. Those wine writers are so difficult. Don't get me going. <laughs> <laughs> So let's differentiate. This is the bologna. Am I saying oh, it right? yes. Bologna from the Dickerson. What is the bologna? Bologna is one of my favorites. So okay. Dickerson is the name of the vineyard. Bologna is the name of the vineyard. Okay. Bologna. Dickerson's 100% Zinfandel. Okay. But bologna is one of the true old line field blends. Wines planted around 1900. Let's define uh, in, field blend. It's because they didn't really, they planted a bunch of different vines and whatever, right? 
Yeah, this is a co-plantation. So back in the old days, they didn't really care to make varietal wines. They just wanted to make the best flavored wine. Yeah. And different regions have slightly different mixes of grapes depending on what they needed. So this is Russian River. So it has a fair mm -hmm. amount of Alicante Boucher because they had trouble getting color. Uh, but they also had let, had to let it hang long enough. So they needed acidity. So it's got some Carignan. And it's got a little Mataro in it okay. as well. Yeah. And a little Petit Sorel. So I pick all the grapes together and I co-ferment them so that you get all the goodness and all the synergies that those grapes bring to one another. But made, made exactly the same way Dickerson has made, you know, the same open top fermenters, the same time in barrel, uh, the same native yeast. But of course, native yeast is another place we can go for if you're interested. Yep. But native yeast is part of terroir. Now, native yeast, every vineyard has a fingerprint, we know now, based on all this good DNA work we can do with PCR. Every vineyard has... PCR? A fingerprint that PCR? is PCR? identical for that particular vineyard. And PCR is what? PCR, a polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it's right. a, <laughs> and just Yeah, yeah, don't you know polymerase chain reaction? It's the new way we have of looking at mixed solutions of organisms and identifying them with their DNA. People used it originally on gut microflora when they were trying to figure out, you know, why people had colitis and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it turns out you can use it in vineyards. So we can look at the mix of microflora in, for instance, fermentation solutions. We can look at microflora on grapes by crushing the grapes all together. And we can identify every fungus and every bacteria within that particular solution. So it's quite amazing. Wow, you're so into science. This is not enough, this one conversation. <laughs> we need to do this again. Wild Beast, and you know what? It's gone so fast. Joel, really, I mean it. I want to have you back again and dive deeper because the stories bring to life the wine, and yet there's lots of education wedged in the middle crevices, which are amazing. I'm going to close this right now, not that I want to, but because you need to go on and have your life and other people <laughs> need to. But I want to invite you back again. Will you come back, please, you know, soon and talk with us again? Because this is amazing. I, I love all the history, all of the science, all of the backstory. It's, it's been terrific. I would be delighted to do that. Okay. It's, uh, it's great fun to talk to you. You have good questions. And this technology... It's amazing. Isn't we can it? do it. I mean, it's not that hard. It's not yeah. like I have to travel any place that I can just pull out my computer and we can talk. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. cool. Bringing us together through wine and technology. It's good. So thank you so much for a great chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Natalie. All right. Yeah. You take we'll care. see you soon. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Bye. Good luck. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Joel Peterson. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I love Joel's story about tasting wines as a child and learning to identify aromas, like not just apples, but the type of apples by smelling and eating them. That's how we all can learn to be better sniffers and tasters. Two, the historical roots of Zinfandel and its links to Croatia when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as well as the Venetian courts, is fascinating, as is the detective work to establish the grape's true heritage and parentage. Its history goes back to 1488, and it's one of the twelve founding grapes of all wine grapes. 3. I now understand better why Lodi makes such great Zinfandel with its deep sandy soils that were once part of an ancient ocean bed. This produces larger grape clusters with smaller skin-to-flesh ratios, resulting in less harsh tannins and a smoother, juicier, fruitier wine. 4. I also appreciate how wine achieves sweet spots of different alcohol levels where everything is in balance, i.e. the fruit and the acidity, say at 13.8% alcohol, but maybe not at 13.9%, especially when it comes to Zinfandel. 5. The concept of Erwar is fascinating and something I want to explore more in the wines I taste in terms of their influences. And 6. 
I love the story of the Ravenswood name, including all the Raven folklore and Poe and Odin. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Janet Fletcher, the author or co-author of nearly 30 books on food and beverage, including Cheese and Wine. She publishes the weekly Planet Cheese blog, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Savour, Fine Cooking, and Food and Wine. We're talking about wine and cheese pairings for the holidays. In the meantime, if you missed episode 45, go back and take a listen. It's all about pairing wines with turkey, whether that's for Thanksgiving, if you live in the U.S., or for the upcoming holiday season around the world. I also chat about wine trends that you can completely ignore, and a weird wine defect called mouse. Who knew? I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Unlike poultry and game birds, turkey meat is very dry in texture, especially if I cook it. No, I can't cook. What am I saying? (laughs) I pull corks, I don't cook. Even with the best of cooks, turkey is not your friend in terms of juiciness. Good options, wine-wise, are crisp whites, like Riesling and Pinot Grigio. And yes, you can drink red wine with white meat. Pinot Noir, Beaujolais, Gamay, Zinfandel all have juicy, berry-ripe flavors that go well with the turkey. What you want to avoid, really, are grippy tannin, big reds, like Cabernet. A big buttery Chardonnay from California or Chile can complement the roasted smoky flavors of squash, chestnuts, and pecan stuffing. But if you'd rather have a contrast to the richness of cream sauces and dressings, try a crisp New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc or an Austrian Gruner Veltliner. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wine tips that Joel Peterson shared. You can find links to the wines we tasted in the show notes, the video version of this chat, where you can find me on Facebook Live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m., and how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 104. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a lip-smacking delicious Zinfandel. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.